Hello, everyone, and welcome to our August webinar, Your ATE Proposal, GATT Evaluation. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the ATE Evaluation Resource Center at Western Michigan University. I'm Kristen Martens, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. With me here at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is Lori Wingate, the Director of Evaluate. Also joining us today is Gerhard Salinger, who after almost 25 years recently retired as a program officer at the National Science Foundation. And during his tenure, he helped develop the ATE program. He also was a program officer in the Division of Research on Learning, Funding Proposals and Materials Development, and Teacher Professional Development for secondary schools. Also joining us today is Asa Bradley, who teaches physics at Spokane Falls Community College in Spokane, Washington. Last year, as part of the Mentor Connect pilot project, she completed an application for an NSF small grant for institutions new to the ATE program called Rebranding the 21st Century IT Technician. Asa interviewed several external evaluators before choosing Carol Bradley of the Allison Group to work with her team, which turned out to be one of the best decisions she thinks she's ever made. Which brings us to Terrell Bailey, I'm sorry, Terrell Bailey, who is the founder and president of the Allison Group in Seattle, Washington. Collaborative evaluation with a systems thinking component are areas of focus in her practice. Terrell has been involved with the ATE program for 15 years as a workforce development consultant and external evaluator. Also behind the scenes, making sure this webinar runs smoothly, we have Mike Lisecki from the Maytech at Maricopa Community College. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. This webinar has been developed specifically for individuals who are interested in developing proposals for NS NSF's ATE program. So everyone most likely already knows that ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. To accompany the webinar, we have created an evaluation planning checklist, which you may want to check out after this webinar. It's on our website now, as well as a PDF of the webinar slides. This webinar is being recorded and will email you the link for the recording when it's available, which commonly takes one to two days. As a side note, if you view a recording of the webinar, you won't see the chat box conversations, which will be pretty um, interactive today. So to orient you to the structure of today's webinar, you can see that we are in the midst of the introductions and housekeeping as it's highlighted by the red place mark. The webinar then has three main sections which Lori will be leading and we'll have a check-in with you in the form of an anonymous quiz and then we'll hear from our panelists again following, or we'll hear from our panelists after each section followed by a question break. All three webinar sections will follow the same pattern. So we'll conclude with closing remarks and very importantly a chance to give you, for you to give us your feedback through an online survey which will be available immediately following the presentation. So after that we will wish you the best of luck with your proposal and if you have any questions at, during the webinar we invite you to contact us with the questions or continue the dialogue on Facebook, I'm sorry, after the webinar. So let's finish up with the housekeeping and a brief orientation to our webinar. This webinar is presented through Blackboard and it's clear by the hands that are being raised that you, many of you are already familiar with Blackboard functions. But for those of you that are new to our webinar system, this is a screenshot of what you should see on the far left of your screen. So if you notice the hand icon to raise your hand, you just click on the icon. Just below is the participants box and this box lists everyone who is attending the webinar. At the bottom left is the chat box where you can type questions and comments that you would like the presenters to address. You can do it at any time and I'll keep track of the submissions so that we can address them at the scheduled question and answer breaks. To ensure that everyone can follow the chat conversation, which we really encourage everyone to participate in, be sure that the room tab is selected. This tab is located below the chat box to the far left. So let's practice using the chat box now. 
If you'll please type the name of the organization you're from and how many people are viewing the webinar in the room with you today. Looks like they're starting to come in there. Great. If we have a polling question, be sure you don't type the letter answer into the chat box. Instead, you want to navigate to the icon to the right of the hand and select the letter that coincides with your answer. So now let's practice a poll. Go ahead and select the response that best describes you or your team. And Mike, can we pull up those answers? I know there's still some coming in. Okay, very good. So it looks like um, C, I, have, I already have an ATE grant, is um, a little higher than the rest of them. So that's great. Congratulations for those of you that have already been funded. The last tool I want to show you is the marker tool. To use the marker tool, first, you click on the marker icon, which appears just to the right of the participants box, and then you select your color. So let's try that now. On this map, you can indicate your location using the marker tool. And if you're joining us from outside the U.S., you can make your mark off the coast in the direction of your location. So we have somebody in Michigan, not too surprising. Someone in Texas. All right, excellent. So by the end of the webinar, it's our intent that you will be able to know what evaluative elements should be included in a proposal and where, and understand how evaluation can be leveraged to strengthen a proposal. So remember that you can type your questions and comments in the chat box at any time, and we'll go over those at the question break. So now I'll turn things over to Lori. Well, thank you, Kristen, and welcome, everybody. Um, we the, trying something new this this time around with our webinar. We're offering it. This is the second time we've offered it this month. So we had a pretty big uh, group on Wednesday and a much smaller group today. So um, we definitely should have time to answer all your questions. So be sure, as Kristen mentioned, if you have questions, just to go ahead and type them in. Um, in the chat box at any point. I'm just curious, given this new strategy, are, are any of you here today because someone who came on Wednesday recommended it? If you could just raise your hand if that's true for you. Okay, I don't think so. And um, it, is, was anybody here on Wednesday? Did anybody find it so fascinating they had to come back for a second round? Hi, Jason. Okay, great. Well, that we're, it was an experiment, so it's interesting to see how it's going. Well, so all the information that we're going to share with you today in this webinar is included in the checklist that Kristen mentioned earlier. And for those of you who were registered as of early afternoon Eastern time yesterday, I did um, email you. I hope I did. Email. I'm just wondering if I forgot the attachment, which sometimes happens. I meant to email you the link for the checklist, but as Kristen mentioned, it's on our website. Um, so if you have any questions about that, if you've had a chance to look at it again, don't hesitate to ask us. And um, be sure to, when you do get a chance to work with it, um, check out the links. We've included lots of links that provide a lot more information about the um, topics we're covering today. So be sure to check out those as well. So the check checklist looks like this, and it's organized um, by proposal component. It doesn't list all the components, um, just, the sec just the sections where information related to the evaluation is going to be needed. So um, we're going to be pretty much following the organization of this checklist today. And these are the required contents of an NSF proposal, and this is according to the NSF grant proposal guide. And these red check marks indicate components where there should be information related to your evaluation. And we're going to be discussing how to incorporate evaluation elements into each of these sections to strengthen your proposal and in hope, hopefully increase your chances for a favorable review. So I'm going to work through each of these components right in the order that you see them listed, uh, even though that we would actually want to, in reality, you would want to start with your project description. But we'll start with the cover sheet. And the cover sheet is automatically generated as you provide answers to questions in the Fastlane system. Evaluation shows up here in the form of a box you're going to need to check 
if you will be collecting information from or about human subjects, more commonly known as people, as part of your project's evaluation or research efforts. If it's not practical to obtain your approval uh, from your institution's human subjects institutional reboard, uh, review board before you submit your proposal, um, and that'd be great if you could do that, and then you would indicate the date there where I have the arrow. Um, but if that's not possible, you want to indicate pending and in that box. And then just be cognizant, you will need approval before the grant's awarded, so you want to move ahead with the process as far as you reasonably can so that you don't have to scramble if and when you get that wonderful news that your proposal has been recommended for funding. Next is a project summary. Now this document is going to be used by the NSF program officers to determine how to group the proposals that they all the all the proposals they get and assign them to reviewers. So you want to start off with a real strong and specific statement about what your project is about and who it's going to serve. In fact, you might want to try to just include that key information right there in the first sentence. What's your disciplinary focus? Who is your audience? And what are your main activities? Make it real clear. Make it easier on the program officers. And make sure that you get your proposal into the right hands. Basically, in one page, you've got to provide an overview of your project's activities and main audiences and statements about your project's intellectual merit and broader impact. These are the main NSF review criteria. And a lot of you already have funding according to your responses to the polls. You know this. Um, there's a lot of sub-criteria, and you may not be able to address all those sub-criteria in the limited space, so you want to focus on the ones that are most relevant to your proposal. Boiled down, intellectual merit is really about the project's potential to advance knowledge, and broader impacts is about the project's potential to benefit society. And those, that is the language of the National Science Foundation. And you want to be aware that the ATE program has some specific review criteria for, just for that program that relate to evaluation. Um, here, and here they are. Specifically, uh, is the evaluation clearly tied to project outcomes? Will it assess student learning effectively? Will it yield useful information? And will it communicate the results to others? And now the fact that the ATE program has incorporated evaluation concerns right there in its review criteria, that should be a clue to you just how important it is to your proposal. And clearly you know that it's important or you wouldn't be here today on this webinar with us. Next is your project description. This is that 15-page narrative that's the bulk of your proposal. And you have to cover a lot of ground in these 15 pages, as you can see here. These are the key elements of your project description. And the two pieces where evaluation needs to figure prominently are results of prior NSF support and, of course, the evaluation plan. So let's look at prior NSF support first. Um, if the co-PI on the proposal has received prior funding from NSF that relates to the current proposal. You have to start the project description with a section that is titled with results from prior support. And as you quote, and this is from NSF, I believe a grant proposal guide, NSF expects you to describe your previous project's outcomes and results. And reviewers are going to be looking for evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work. The grant proposal guide says this section should also be organized around two main headings, which again are intellectual merit and broader impacts. This is where um, the evaluation, from, evaluation results from your past projects are going to go. And you want to keep in mind that not all the data you have from a prior evaluation um, is necessarily going to be equally important um, to reviewers in, in how they judge your, your prior work. So you want to be selective and report here and give priority to uh, those higher level impacts that you have data about. For example, student outcomes would be more compelling, for example, than website hits or satisfaction ratings. So next I have an exercise where I want to put yourselves in, in the position of a proposal reviewer. We're going to use the marker tools, and you've practiced with those, so you should be able to find them now. So here's some statements that could show up in a results of prior support section. Um, I'd like you to read each one and just use your marker to indicate if you think the information would be compelling to reviewers as evidence of either intellectual merit or broader impact of previously funded work. So if you think yes, you would just use your marker to mark the box in under the green check. And if you think not so much, um, mark the box under the red X. So I'll just give you a moment to work to read, the, read those and work through them on your own.
Okay, so let's just let's look at each of these. So the first statement, the prior project achieved all of its goals. Well, this is impressive and it's very good, but we would definitely want to have more here. You would want to be able to back it up with evidence. So yes, it's a good thing to be able to claim, but it's um, may, it will be much more convincing if you have, you know, as evidenced by X, Y, and Z with some, with some hard data. Second one. The PI and co-PIs published four peer-reviewed articles based on data generated by the project. We have some mixed opinions here. Some think yes, some think no. Now, actually, listing publications is, ex is an expectation for the results of prior support section. And this is sort of an um, external validation affirmation um, that the project produced you know, high quality work, that it got um, into peer-reviewed um, journals. So this is pretty good evidence. Um, so I would definitely want to, you would definitely want to include that. And it is evidence that, that the product, the, the, excuse me, the project can be productive in the area of advancing intellectual merit. Okay, let's consider the next one. The project developed three lab manuals, provided 40 faculty with professional development, and served 125 students. So everyone here is saying, absolutely, this is really, this is compelling, this is good evidence. Um, I think it's important to, this is my opinion, I think it's very important to describe the reach. But if I were a reviewer and had, you know, a whole bunch of really high quality, compelling proposals that I was looking at, I would look for a little bit more in terms of the so what. This is what the project did. This was its activity. What was the outcome? What is the difference in technician education, in the workforce, in industry, in two-year colleges because of the, this work that was done? The faculty got professional development, so what? Students were, went through the program, so what? That kind of thing. So it's good to provide those numbers, but then go a bit further with evidence of impact and outcomes. Okay, finally, the project supported internships for 75 students, more than half of whom secured full-time positions in their internships. And everyone here agreed, yes, this is good evidence, and I would agree here. It's like, not only did they have the internships, but it made a difference. Now, we want to, might want to have some comparative data there, like what it was before they had the internships, or some feedback from industry, but I think in and of it itself, this is a pretty compelling piece of evidence. So what you want to do is take your own results of prior support section. And again, a lot of you are going to be going, it sounds like going back for more funding. So you want to take this piece very seriously and be able to show that you, you know, did high quality work and made a difference with your prior work. So do this own critical review of your um, prior su support statements and better yet, have somebody not associated with your project take a look and tell you what they think. So I want to go back to this slide for a second. If you've had prior NSF funding, you have to discuss those accomplishments, as I mentioned, in terms of intellectual merit and broader impact. So in what other document have we already discussed you need to do this as well under these headings? Go ahead and use that chat box to tell me what you think, and I'm going to get a drink, quick drink of water. So there's two places in your proposal that you need to organize your uh, information around these headings, intellectual merit and broader impacts. And the one we're on now is results of prior support. There is one other place, one other section of your proposal where you need to use these headings. And if you want to just put that in your chat box, we'll see how you're doing. MSS project. Project summary, exactly. So in your project summary, Valerie, Max, great. Absolutely. So in your project summary, that's when you're looking forward. This is what we plan to achieve with regard to intellectual merit and broader impacts. You're very optimistic and you've laid out a great plan. Now if you get your funding and you go going back for additional um, funding from the National Science Foundation, then you have to be able to say, be able to follow up on that basically. They're not asking you to respond exactly to what you said in your project summary before, but wouldn't it be great if you could take that project summary that you did for your prior proposal, rewrite it in the past tense, and be able to produce evidence to show that you achieve those aims with regard to intellectual merit, broader impacts. So there's a strong parallel there, and um, one is just prospective and one is retrospective. 
So we'll zoom out a bit. Um, we're still in the project description, which is the main piece of your proposal package. But we're going to skip all the way down to the evaluation plan as you see here. There are a whole lot of important elements in between that you're going to need to address from the rationale um, all the way down through sustainability and dissemination. But of course our focus today is on evaluation. So in this section, which is going to be about one at least one and at the most probably three pages of your 15 page project description. You want to identify your evaluator and briefly describe that person's experience and expertise related to the work you're proposing. I'm talking about a paragraph here. Um, and of course you need to describe the actual evaluation plan, what will be evaluated and how. So the ATE program solicitation um, specifies that the funds to support an evaluator independent of the project must be requested. So a common question that proposers ask is, well, how do I find an evaluator? It is not like there is a section in the yellow pages for this. So your best resource may well be other ATE PI's recommendations. A good bet uh, is to ask a center PI. They tend to have more experience with evaluation and evaluators. And you can get a listing of all ATE centers um, from the ATE Central website as well as ATEcenters.org and maybe um, Mike or uh, someone at Maytech can include those links in the chat box for us. They're also, I believe, in our um, checklist. So the American Evaluation Association maintains a national directory of evaluators and this is searchable by keyword and region. So if you're looking for somebody you know, close to you, that it's a nice feature to be able to search geographically. Wherever you are, you're probably not all that far from a large university and you can um, just do a little bit of investigating to find out if maybe they have a research center or an institute that engages in evaluation work. Um, we currently have an evaluator directory on Evaluate's website, but we're phasing that out and we'll be replacing it with a LinkedIn group. We have a LinkedIn group. We're, we're going to rely on that more heavily. So if you're an evaluator, um, we would encourage you to, to um, hook up with Evaluate on LinkedIn. But remember, these are just sources um, to give you leads to find an evaluator. Just because an evaluator is in a directory or is recommended by another PI doesn't mean they're the right person for your project. You really have to determine that person's qualifications and fit uh, with your project for yourself. In just a little bit, Asa is going to share with us how she located and selected her evaluator, Tara Bailey, who's also on the line with that, um, with us. So on that note, I just kind of want to check in to see where we are in the webinar. Uh, so you're following along. Um, we're coming up on our first little quiz. This is not meant to be threatening in any way. You're going to use your markers and uh, it will be um, anonymous. And then after that little break, we'll hear from our panelists again and also we'll lead off, as I mentioned, talking about how she uh, found Terrell. And then we'll have a question break. So again, if you have questions, Go ahead and um, put those in now. Let's do our little quiz. So HSIRB approval may be submitted to NSF at any time as long as it's before data collect are collected from human subjects. Do you think this is true or false? You just want to go ahead and use your marker tools and circle the best answer. Someone just doesn't want to commit there. It's true and false. Well, the better answer is false. Um, you definitely have to have your HSIRB approval with, on file with NSF before they will grant you your award. And this can be a fairly involved process depending on the kinds of data you want to collect. Um, so you want to um, have this on your radar ahead of time, especially it can, it's more complicated if you're going to be gathering data from miners. Um, right, and somebody, nice job with a marker. Somebody actually put a ward. Yeah, the, the more correct answer is um, you, you will need to get your approval before your award is made. Okay, next one. So the most important thing to do in a results of prior support section is to indicate how many people your project served. This isn't so much a true or false, but an agree or disagree. So just use your markers again there. Well, there's a lot of agreement about disagreeing with that statement. 
Yeah, I mean it's important to talk about the reach of your project and, and, and your level of productivity, but you do want to take it a bit further and talk about what difference you made. And that, that's really a key um, point I would like to emphasize. That what, what you did and, and your level of productivity is one thing, but push it a bit further and talk about what difference you made to students, to faculty, to industry, to technician education. Okay, last question. NSF maintains a directory of approved evaluators on its, web, on its website. True or false? You are correct, folks. That it would be quite convenient if there was, but there is actually no such thing as a directory of evaluators that has that have been vetted by NSF. It is really um, on the, the PI and the project team to seek those folks out and make sure they're the right person um, to work with you in your project. So that's actually a nice segue to hear from Asa, um, who's going to first, um, Asa actually if you would maybe just give a little bit of your background about how you got involved with ATE and then um, go ahead and tell us about how you found Terrell and decided she was the right person to work with you. Sure. Um, I uh, was accepted into a program last year called Mentor Connect that was, um, that's also NSF ATE funded, um, which was basically created to um, get people involved in the ATE grants that have previously not been involved. Because there's, there's actually the majority of community colleges across um, the United States have not received an NSF grant. So I had a lot of support while I was creating my um, my application uh, and my proposal. And so I got recommendations uh, from our mentor in Mentor Connect and also through um, different ATE centers. And then the other thing I did was I went to the, um, there's a national, a professional national organization for evaluators. And I went to their website and looked through their directory um, for evaluators that were uh, close to me. And I'm up in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State. So I looked through um, to, and I found some evaluators in Oregon and also in Washington. So I had a list of um, probably about five or six people that I felt would um, uh, would probably be a good fit for us. And then I sent this list of questions to each of them. And what I didn't realize until after I talked to Carol was that it was quite an extensive list of questions. Um, but I was asking things like, have you had um, experience with um, a grant like ours? Um, what's your philosophy on um, evaluations? How do you work with other people? How do you collaborate? Um, and then because we were approving for a small grant, um, I also asked about um, you know, cost sharing um, in terms of um, uh, just travel and other things. Um, so that's how I went about doing it. And then I had a conversation with each one of the people that returned um, questions with answer. Um, and then in the end, um, I ended up picking the evaluator that I think had the most experience on projects like ours, um, were, was the most flexible in terms of um, working with us on the plan. Um, and also, but mainly, I think um, Carol and I just communicated really well together. And that was something that my mentor in the Mentor Connector told me was, remember that you're going to be working with this person not just while you're writing your evaluation plan, you're going to be working with them during very stressful periods when you're trying to get your reporting into NSF. Um, and I just felt like Carol and I were a really good fit. Um, so that's how I ended up choosing her. And I think that's all I got. Thank you, Asa. Let's turn it over to Carol and see what she has to, to say about the first section. Uh, thanks very much. So I uh, I did I was surprised at the number of questions that uh, Asa had, and but they were all good questions. So um, I answered sincerely and completely, including the philosophy of evaluation and uh, my background with ATE overall, um, as well as IT projects in particular, because that's the domain of uh, Asa's project um, and the IT skill standards and. Um, and it turned out that we, because I'm also from Seattle, we had uh, a couple of um, uh, local Washington State uh, folks in common that were going to be working with her project that I already knew. So 
um, after hearing what Asi just said, it seems like um, those were the main things that uh, that she was looking for. Thank you, Carol. Let's turn it over to Gerhard. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> Although I worked at NSF for for many years, I used to point out that I'm I'm talking of from a personal point of view and not necessarily that of NSF. Uh, in terms of what we were just talking about, uh, we moved I think, several years ago the uh, prior work, the discussion of prior work from the last thing to about the second item. And the idea was for you to demonstrate that you're aware of other similar work and how you'd build on it and also uh, to say what you've done, and I would push or emphasize very much what Lori did, that it's not what you did, but what impact it has had. Uh, reviewers are quite uh, taken with with, uh, with technician education. Uh, you, you need to show how what you've done uh, increases the, the competency and the quality of technicians for the uh, technological workforce. Uh, the uh, other thing I would uh, well suggest to, to do is that you uh, certainly read the solicitation. People uh, get tied up in their own project and don't really check that it, it fits the solicitation uh, given. I will also emphasize uh, Lori's point that Try to get your uh, almost complete draft of your proposal written early enough so that someone familiar with NSF programs, but not necessarily your project, can read the proposal and tell you what you thought, what you you might have thought you said, but you really didn't say. Um, the uh, another point is that we get the APE pro gets about 200 to 250 proposals, and a fairly short time needs to distribute them into something like uh, 15 to 20 panels. And it's a, 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 it's a process that's taken, that's, um, that's done very quickly. And so getting your first sentence to say, what, what's the content of your proposal, who's the audience, uh, is very important because if, the, if the, a program officer has to read halfway down the page to find that out, uh, your pro proposal may get assigned to a panel that isn't the best one for it. In terms of evaluators, many projects I think have gone to having both an external and an internal evaluator. Uh, the external evaluator uh, is re required, but very often you can get quicker turnaround of data uh, by using an internal evaluator who works with your external evaluator. A sense your external evaluator becomes sort of a meta evaluator, making sure that the protocols are appropriate and that the protocols are being followed. And just one last point on the IRB: uh, the, the NSF is getting stricter and stricter about this. You do need to write pending in that uh, appropriate box if you had, if unless there are no issues of research on human subjects. Uh, and they, you should warn the IRB that a request might be coming and that involves certain features. That the first indication of a negotiation for your award, that is the program is asking you to respond to certain questions, you should begin to amass the data required to, to cover at least the first year of your award, which may involve less data taking. Uh, the IRB's uh, this, uh, approval is generally for only one year. And so subsequently you can make additional requests to your IRB for activities to be carried out in other years as needed. But you do need to uh, have a, a, an approved IRB for at least year one. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. We're going to take some questions from the um, audience now. And um, the first one I think, Gerhard, you could address. If you have never had NSF funding, how do you address the prior support section? This uh, person is saying that they wouldn't want to leave it blank or unaddressed. I think that you, you be perfectly honest. I mean, we have a lot of first-time people. 
so you you uh, state that, but provide information about why you're the right person or an, and your institution is the right place to do this work, and and then show that you're aware of other work that's going on on which you can build. Great, thank you so much. Um, is there, a, Lori? This question might be a good one for you. Is there a program? to um, graduate in or get a formal recognition license as an evaluator? I'm going to answer that question in two ways. Um, one, because a question I think a lot of prospective proposers have is, you know, is how do I know someone's qualified? Is there a degree? Is there a certificate? Uh, and there isn't. You do not need any special uh, recognition <laughs> or certification or anything. Um, in the United States to say you're an evaluator. Uh, so again, it's it's buyer beware here. You really want to do that legwork and find out if the person has prior experience doing evaluation, preferably evaluation, not just research. Um, and they have, you know, the the academic training or you know equivalent experience to be qualified to do the job. So that's that's answer to one. Answer two is there other Ways to get you know formal training and evaluation. Absolutely, uh, Jason mentioned we have a PhD program here in at Western Michigan University that's in interdisciplinary evaluation. There are a, a smattering of other PhDs in evaluation embedded in different um, you know disciplinary areas throughout the United States, and there are quite a lot of professional development offerings such as the Evaluators Institute. Um, where people can go in the summer or another, you know, like for uh, fairly focused, intensive training um, in evaluation. So there's lots of different ways people get training in evaluation and and can build their, um, you know, background and knowledge and so forth. But there isn't something you can look for, something specifically on somebody's, you know, Vita to to flag them as someone who's qualified to do evaluation. Unfortunately, there's very few degrees that are actually in evaluation per se. In fact, not to to our own form, but I think Western Michigan University is the only place where you can actually get a degree in evaluation and not like a degree in psychology or education or sociology with a specialization in evaluation. Okay, great. Thank you, Lori. Um, Carol, should you discuss fees right away with an evaluator? Or would that be crass? What do you think about that from an evaluator's side? Uh, you mean the uh, discuss the qualification? No fees. How much it costs to hire you? Oh, fees. No, I don't think it is at all. It, you know, I mean, maybe not the very first thing out of your mouth, but certainly it could be in the first conversation because if somebody's way way overpriced, and, you know, then. Uh, or way underpriced, and you're thinking, oh, that's right, that they don't have the qualifications I need. I mean, I think that would be fine to have in a you know, first conversation, at least to get ballpark. Okay, and also, in your experience, when you are looking for an evaluator, how did you um, address this issue about fees? Um, I think we were we were very upfront about that we were going for a small grant. Um, we also talked about the fact that we were clueless when it came to evaluations, so that we were going to be needing a lot of hand holding. Um, and then I think when I talked to people in person over the phone, we definitely discussed fees because some of the evaluators were way out of our ballpark. Um, and we'd also gotten a lot of um, you know guidelines from webinars like this and also from Laura's checklist. It's really great, um, the resources that are listed on there. So I knew that I was looking at, um, and I think this comes up later in the the webinar, what, what percentage of my grant could go to evaluation? And some of the evaluations that we talked about, their fees were just so much above that that I already knew that I wasn't going to be able to work with them because they were only working on really large projects. So it was we had that conversation early on. We talked about fees early. Okay, great, thanks. Gerard, there was an email question from Linda Nisix, and she said that um, she's been reading the new Office of Management and Budge Budgets uniform guidance and articles describing the changes. And some experts are saying that based on the uniform guidance, you should not be naming evaluators in the grant proposal because you need to have this service put out for bids if you get the grant. Now this is contrary to what NSF and other federal agencies have been telling us. Can you clarify? Uh, yes, the, the, the Office of Management and Budget Circular is really for contracts. And most evaluators are hired as consultants or on subawards. These are not at contracts, uh, and 
that a lot of the activities are not quite specified. And the, these are, um, the funding for these are reported on lines G3 and G5 respectively of, of the, in the uh, budget sheets. Contracts would be recorded on line G6. And the, the PI one, if you do choose, you do not have to choose the least expensive person, but you do have to, to justify why you're doing it. And this is a federal viewpoint. Schools, however, may have different rules which can trump the federal guideline. So the proposer should point out the difference to their sponsored research or financial office uh, and try to get them to agree that that uh, these, these are consultantships and or subawards, depending on how you plan to do it. And uh, also, if the proposers interview several evaluators, such as, as Asa did, and choose one, this may be sufficient to meet the school rule. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Laurie, one more question. Pat is wondering, how do internal and external evaluators work together? Does the external evaluator review the work of the internal evaluator? Um, that's definitely an option, and it really, you really have to work out what's best um, for the, the individual project. I'll tell you how we do it. Now, we are probably a bit of an anomaly because we have here at Western, we have a lot of capacity to do evaluation. But what we do is the, like after, at the end of this webinar, and I know you're all going to stay on after the presentation to do our survey, but we're going to analyze that immediate feedback survey um, ourselves. We're going to do our, assess our reach, and how, how many, what percentage of our target audience are we reaching? How engaged are they? We're going to do that ourselves. We're going to do our workshop um, evaluations, immediate feedback ourselves. Now, our external evaluator is going to do the high, look at the higher level outcomes. You know, what difference does it make over time for people who engage with us? How are they changing practice? So as we move down that the outcomes chain, um, the, our evaluator is going to look at the higher level outcomes and we're going to look at more of the short term outcomes. That's how we do it. Um, folks who are working on a real more co more constrained budget might actually be managing all the, the data collection themselves internally and turning that data over to their external evaluator for analysis and interpretation. Another option um, which Gerhard actually has advocated for is to have the evaluator um, act as a meta-evaluator, so evaluating the internal evaluation, which I think Pat was getting at in terms of reviewing the internal evaluator's work, just sort of an external view, an objective view, or at least independent view to make sure that the right things are being looked at, the instrumentation is sound, the, the analyses are sound. So there's different options, and I think those are kind of the, maybe the three main ways to go about it. Great. Thank you so much, Lori. Let's um, now go ahead into the second section, and I'll just turn it back over to Lori. Well, and thanks for all your great questions. Keep them coming. So in this part of the webinar, we're going to be focusing on the evaluation plan itself. So we've talked about identifying your evaluator, and now you're going to need to provide some detail about the evaluation itself. I think there's four important pieces to any evaluation plan. Basically needs to describe um, the focus of the evaluation, the plan for gathering data, the analytical and interpretive procedures, and the reporting schedule and projected uses. So first you'll need to clarify what aspects of the project will be evaluated. It's important here to make sure the evaluation focus is well aligned with what the project is doing and trying to achieve. Remember that's actually one of the ATE specific review criteria that the, the evaluation plan is clearly tied to outcomes. For example, if your project is focused on developing students' entrepreneurial skills, it probably wouldn't make a lot of sense to invest your evaluation resources into assessing their learning in their technical content areas. So how many of you are familiar with logic models? Just raise your hand to let me know. Um, if you've had exposure, if you've used them. So we have a fair amount, amount of hands going up, maybe about a third. Um, I wonder if those of you who have used them, who have used them maybe just want to put in a comment box, the chat box, what you think the benefits are of using logic, logic models, or if you feel, you know, if there's disadvantage, you might want to share those as well. I'll try to glance over at that, those as I'm talking. Um, I find them to be helpful 
for both project design and evaluation planning, I think they're really helpful for bringing the key aspects of projects into sharper relief and make sure there are actually logical connections between the activities and the intended outcomes. And I see um, Lori is saying also the logic model helps to connect the dots. Emma is saying keep the project on task for organization. Yep, Kathy is saying great visual tool to make sure everyone's on the same page. Those are exactly the, you know, I, I definitely share those sentiments. Um, I do want to point out they're not required for ATE proposals, but they actually are for some NSF programs. Um, so maybe that is the direction the ATE programs I'm going. I'm not sure. So basically, um, as was mentioned, it's a visual de depiction, a graphic depiction of what a project is doing and trying to achieve, and how those things are really linking together. There's lots of ways to put together a logic model, and they can get pretty complicated as they show the relationship between the project components. This is an extremely basic um, example, and it's for a fictional project that we made up just to demonstrate this. Um, demonstrates the logic model. So we're going to look at each component so you don't have to worry about uh, trying to take it in all, all in right now. It's not unusual for logic models to start with inputs. Those are the resource, resources brought to bear on the project. We're starting with activities here. And the reason for that is I find that oftentimes the inputs is the weakest component of the logic model. So if you can't say more than our inputs are faculty and NSF funding, things like that, it may not be worth um, bring that into your into your model. Um, so that's why I'm starting with activities. In this column, you want to convey the main things you're going to do with your grant dollars. And here we have things like lectures and dissemination and um, follow-up support and so forth. I find it useful to include outputs in the model, and again, this is a place where you'll see lots of variation. Some folks don't put outputs in the model. But these are the tangible things that are going to be generated by your activities, things you can see and count and document. Um, in this example, we have trained faculty and some modules and a model curriculum. For your short-term outcomes, you'll want to identify what should happen as a direct result of your project activities. And I find it helpful to focus on knowledge and ability changes here. Basically, what do your project's beneficiaries, whether they're faculty or staff or whomever, what should they know and be able to do as a result of the work supported by your project? At the level of midterm outcomes, we want to be able to show how we're meeting that need that was identified in the rationale section, which we didn't talk about, but you do want to have very early on in your proposal a statement of the rationale for the project, why it's needed. In this example, we have more students entering green energy technology careers and employers hiring those graduates. At the highest level of impact, there should be a very clear linkage to the purposes of the ATE program. And you may not be able to bring about this change on, all on your own, of course, but you should be able to demonstrate a logical connection with the ATE program goals. This is a good way to reinforce your project's alignment and fit with ATE. Gerhard mentioned read that solicitation, make sure you're being responsive to, to what the pro program is looking for. And this is a good check for that. It's a lot of work to put together a good proposal, as many of you know. And it's going to be a, a terrible shame if you submit to a program that doesn't fit your project. Or, or even if it fits your project, but reviewers can't see how it fits. If you want to include your logic model in, a, in your proposal, and that's what I recommend, um, you want to keep it to, you know, you don't want it to take up pages and pages. It should be half a page, one page. Um, it's really a means to visualize and communicate what's salient about your project, how the pieces fit together in a cohesive package. I, they're also quite useful for evaluation planning, and that's why people tend to see them as falling into the evaluator's domain. Um, a good place to start to use it for planning is to consider the general types of questions that could be asked with regard to each level of the model. So to use a logic model to aid in focusing an evaluation, I think it's helpful to go through each level and frame questions that will help you learn about the quality and impact of your project. And here's some just really, really generic examples just to, to get you kind of in tune with the level of questions you might be asking. For, if you're looking at activities and outputs, you want to plan on being able to answer questions like who you reached, what they thought about their experience with the project, what's the quality or utility of the activities and products. This is largely accountability type information. It's really important to have this, but the evaluation shouldn't stop there. For short-term outcomes, the evaluation should determine how the project affected participants. 
change their knowledge, skills, abilities, attitudes, for example, um, if that lines up with how you framed your short-term outcomes. Next, the evaluation can, pro can progress to answering questions about changes in practice or behavior, assuming, again, that that fits with how you did your outcomes. Uh, these are, again, this is just an example. Um, so you have to tailor it for your own work and make sure your, the questions you're asking are responsive to what you're proposing. In terms of long-term outcomes, often these are pretty far down the road. Um, you may not be able to assess them, especially if in your, in your first cycle of funding. If you can, all the better. Um, but here you might look at the cumulative effects of the project's various outcomes, what was achieved that can be sustained, what was transformative. Those are things that NSF is interested in. It really depends on the nature of the project, but here you're pushing to demonstrate the project's contribution to the ATE program level goals. And you may not have all the resources to answer all the questions you come up with. So you want to be able to, you want to prioritize what's most important and best fits the stage of your project. And that's what focusing the evaluation is all about, really. Um, again, these were very generic examples of evaluation questions. And you want to tailor the focus of your evaluation based on what your project is doing. So let's try to do that with our example. Um, I just bring this up again to give you a, a sense of, of this model. Um, and then we'll work on how to map evaluation questions and data collection onto a logic model. Um, again, it's about aligning the plan with a specific project, not proposing something overly generic. So an evaluation question we could pose that focuses on short-term outcomes is this. To what extent and how did faculty implementation of course modules affect student interest in learning in green tech? Now, there's a lot packed into this question. So we would want to unpack it into its component parts. Um, so, so take a moment to digest that question and then kind of unpack what are the different things we're really asking about here. Just go ahead and um, use your chat box to answer. It's OK to ask complex questions as long as we can really delineate what's really being asked. And think about who's, who we're asking about, right? That's, so Kathy says, did students enroll in other green classes? Right, so that's a measure of growing interest. Right, so we, there's, at least we know we need to gather data, or we're asking something about students. We're also asking about faculty. I see at least four things embedded here, and it's, of course, more obvious to me because I wrote the question. But I see, did faculty implement the modules? Did they do it with fidelity? Um, did it, how did it affect student interest? How did it affect student learning? So we could, we could even probably take it further. So thinking about things about did, how, to what extent did faculty implement? Um, how well was it implemented? How did it affect student interest? And how did it affect student learning? What kind of data could we collect here to help us answer this complex question, which really has um, several sub-questions embedded in it? How would we be able to say we wanted to make a claim that we improved student interest in learning in, in green tech? What kind of evidence would we need to support that claim? Go ahead and Use your chat box, and I'm going to take a little water break. All right, so Jason's saying we could look at enrollment, enrollment going up in, in the future over a baseline, for example. Before, looking at before and after enrollment again. Emma says test scores increasing. Right. So it's not just about interest, it's also about the competency and knowledge. Great. Course evaluations, that's an, another great example. Like are they are the faculty getting better reviews from students? That would be another measure. Right. So there's a lot embedded in this question and there's a lot of different kinds of data we could use to get at the answers to those questions. So you're kind of getting the hang of that, yep. So what evaluation questions might we ask at this level of the model? Again, so just 
framing these outcomes in the form of a question. You can just share your thoughts in the chat box. I like to avoid asking evaluation questions in the form of a yes/no, because um, it's rarely a black and uh, rarely we have um, black and white answers. And if you want to ask a yes/no question, then you have the challenge of where do you draw the line between yes, it made a difference, and no, it didn't. So it's always good to ask um, ask evaluation questions as a matter of gradation, for example. So Sylvia says, says, how many grads were hired in field related within six months of graduation, right? So we want to ask, to what extent did this program impact students getting job in the, jobs in this field? And then, right, she's saying we would want to know the extent to which they were retained. We might want to get employer feedback as well. Jason's making a good point. Did enough students graduate to meet the needs of employers? If we made the case that this program was going to meet that regional demand for these technicians, that would be an important question to pose and an important question to get data on. So every proposal needs to have a section where it lays out the rationale for what's being proposed. So there had to have been some evidence, some inkling of why the need was present. Well, how do we know there was a need? How do we know that we needed this particular project? So if it's possible, you want to consider what evidence there was of the need and see if we can go back and use that same kind of evidence to demonstrate that we met that need. This is not super simple stuff. It, it is challenging and it takes some time to wrestle with it. It's always a good idea to check the evaluation's focus to make sure it makes sense in light of the project's age and scope as well. For example, if the project is continuing, um, an existing program, you would likely um, want to be able to go farther with the evaluation than with a brand new endeavor. So after you articulate the focus of the evaluation, you can describe the data collection plan. Here you need to talk about what information you need, how you will collect it, from whom, and when. So this is an excerpt from a real proposal from an evaluation. It's not from an NSF proposal, um, but it is real. And I did shorten it a bit for the presentation. Um, and I, I know how this works, so you're probably already reading it as I talk. So I'll give you just another few seconds to, to read it, and then I want to highlight some things about it. So I just want to point out, so. The evaluation is going to use mixed methods. It's going to gather both qualitative and quantitative data. It's going to be both formative and summative and address the project's merit and worth. And it's going to adhere to best practices for rigorous scientifically based research. Wow, that is really impressive, right? Do you guys agree? Um, actually, it doesn't provide any of the key information about the what, the how, who, and when of data collection that we really need to know. This is an extremely generic and cookie cutter description of an evaluation, and it's likely what you'll get if you wait to the last minute to engage an evaluator to develop your proposal. So this is really not what you want for your proposal. You want to be much more specific. This is a different example of a data collection plan. So think back to those four questions that have to be addressed. How, who, how, what, how, who, and when. I want to give you a minute to read through this and I'm going to pose some questions to you. And Kristen asked me a question offline and the answer Kristen is yes. <laughs> so we're going to go up to the first question. So um, in reading this example, use your, text, your chat box um, and let me know what data will be collected. What is the information that's going to be gathered and used for the evaluation? What are they going to use as evidence? Okay, Valerie and Betsy say going to gather information on knowledge and perceptions. 
Robin says participant ratings and comments, as does Jason. Um, right. So as from this example, we can see that what be, will be collected is participant feedback, evidence of application, and, and data on students, changes in students' knowledge and perceptions. Okay, similarly, how will the data be collected? What are the methods that will be used to get that information? Use your chat box. Right, everyone got that really fast. Surveys and interviews, it's very apparent in this example. Okay, who will provide the information needed for the evaluation? What are the sources of data? Emma points out project staff, Valerie and Betsy, participants and students. Robin says participants and students, right. The whom includes participants and students, and as Emma noted, who will do the collecting, the project staff and the external evaluators also mentioned in this description. And finally, when will the data be collected? Can you tell from this excerpt? Yeah, Emma points out six months following the workshop and the end of each semester, and Valerie and Betsy are on the same. Everyone's on the same. Got it. Yeah, it's very clear. Um, the data are be going to be collected end of workshop, six months post workshop, and at the end of each semester. Now, obviously, this is just three sentences from what should be a you know a one to three page description of your evaluation. So it's just a small example of how data collection, which again is just one component of the evaluation plan, might be described. Um, an alternative is to present the information. This way in a matrix, which is pretty efficient, and here you can see we have our project goal, um, and then we have our evaluation question, and then we have our indicators, and those are just the pieces of information we're going to collect. And here we show we're using multiple measures, um, which is going to enable triangulation of findings. We have multiple measures for this to answer this one question. And then in the next column, we list the data sources. Um, followed by the timing. We could actually add a column here to show who is responsible. And I know there's a lot on this slide, and so you can look at this slide on your own after the webinar if you want to look at it more carefully. Just some quick tips um, when you think about putting together a data collection plan. Um, always try to gather, think about it in terms of building a body of evidence. So try to use multiple methods and both qualitative and quantitative data if you can. It's great if you can embed data collection into regular project activities. If you need students to do a survey, for example, you can have them do it as part of a class rather than trying to track them down later. Using existing data and existing instruments um, can also save time and money. Okay, we'll move on to the third part of the evaluation plan, analysis and interpretations. Basically, how are you going to make sense of the data? Um, we, what kind of comparisons can you make to inform your interpretations? What counts as success? These things tend to get lumped together, analysis and interpretation. I just want to be clear. Analysis is really about organizing and transforming, describing the data. Interpretation is, some, is how you make sense of that. So you can make conclusions about your project's quality, progress, or impact, for example. Finally, you should touch on reporting and use of findings. I want to just remember there's some criteria, some review criteria. They're ATE specific. They're about sharing from sharing findings from the evaluation, producing useful information out of the evaluation. You at least need to describe what types of reports will be developed and when and how those results will be shared. And just keep in mind you'll need data from the evaluation, results from the evaluation for other purposes like the eight annual reports to NSF annual survey of ATE grantees, possibly reports to advisory groups. Um, I want to point out here something you need to go and, and read and digest on your own, which is the Common Guidelines for Education Research and Development. These were developed jointly by NSF and the Institute for Education Sciences. And it, I think Gerhard is probably going to comment on these, so I won't say too much more. But it does talk about different types of um, education development and research projects and the types of um, evidence the type of designs that are appropriate for those different ones. So I just want to emphasize you should go and read that on your own. 
So again, these are the elements of the project description. Sustainability and dissemination, very important. We're not talking about them today, but we do have a webinar clip on our website um, in which ATE Central talks about these things as well as social media uh, and data management plans. So we're going to do our next little quiz. True or false, get ready to use your markers. Evaluation reports are submitted to NSF only at the end of a grant. True or false? All right, you got it. Yep, you got to you have to report something from your evaluation annually with your annual report submitted to your program officer. Logic models are optional for ATE grants. True or false? That's true. They're not required. Um, it is just evaluates position our our resource center's position that they're a good idea for proposals, but they are not required. And mixed methods evaluation studies are recommended only for large scale projects. Right. Um, it's always a good idea to use multiple multiple methods and multiple kinds of data. It will definitely strengthen your evaluation. So we're going to hear from our panelists next, starting from Carol. Okay. Thank you, Lori, very much. So. Uh, Asa and I had a number of conversations along the way um, in, her, in terms of uh, while, while she was developing the proposal, and they were they were general. They weren't just about the evaluation. I guess I want to say that evaluators, at least sometimes, have seen several different kinds of proposals and work with different projects across ATE and can have a unique perspective that they can bring to what you're doing to develop your proposal. So it can be helpful and sort of as a partner um, in the writing uh, of the proposal. And about the logic model, um, I find it to be essential uh, to developing the evaluation plan. So once the proposal was far enough along, since they uh, really didn't have any experience with logic models, I developed a draft. And then Asa and I talked it through. Uh, we made changes. And, uh, and we made sure that we were on the same page about where the logic model was going or where the project was going. And in addition to providing the basis for the evaluation plan, um, the logic model can also highlight strengths and weaknesses of the proposal uh, and of the theory of change for the grant team to use uh, to then strengthen the proposal as they're moving forward. Great. Thank you so much, Terrell. Um, can we now go over to Asa? Um, yes. So I concur with what um, uh, Terrell was saying in terms of getting a lot of the project description um, done early. Um, we started pretty early with our proposal because of the Mentor Connect program. So we started writing and looking at what we wanted to do um, probably uh, in January, February, and then the proposal is due in October, and we were ready to look for an external evaluator in August. Um, but I think if I was redoing it, I would actually start looking at the evaluator earlier than that, um, and only because Terrell did give us a lot of feedback on other sections in our, our project description, the big 15-page part of our, our plan uh, or um, proposal, um, not just so much in terms of changing what we were doing, but changing how we worded it so that it was very clear um, what we were going for and how we were going to evaluate it. Because a lot of times we had really great ideas, um, and then Terrell would ask us questions like, okay, how are you going to see whether or not you reach your goal? Um, and so she was really valuable in giving us um, feedback on all sections of our project description. Um, and then the other thing I wish I would have done differently was um, the checklist that Lori mentioned at the beginning of this webinar. I didn't start looking at that until I was writing the evaluation plan. Um, and it actually would have been really helpful uh, while I was also writing the rest of the project description, um, many of the other sections as well. So I think those are my tips uh, in terms of when you start looking at writing the um, evaluation plan and the logic model, um, because you massage a lot of the other sections based on what you're doing in the evaluation section. And I think that's what I have in terms of um, tips for this part. 
Great. Thank you so much, Asa. Um, it appears I have lost moderator ability, so if someone can forward the fly slide for Gerhard, if you can tell us a little bit about what you um, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I think to go back a little to the uh, external evaluator can uh, help set the questions that really answer uh, or do the evaluation of things in the logic model. You want to be sure that you're, what you're evaluating aligns with, the, with your major goals or your major questions. Uh, so the, the external evaluator can help set those, and the internal evaluator can actually get the data or, or do some of the interviews, um, and, and perhaps also do some of the preliminary analysis. So that the two can work together, I think, uh, very well and, and probably for less expense. Uh, but it's important that you're, you say what you're going to evaluate and that that aligns with your goal. Uh, another important issue there is that the evaluators tend, or a lot of people tend to develop instruments that, for their particular project, but there are a lot of instruments around. And you can get them probably by talking to some, another principal investigator. The ATE program is very collaborative. But it would be, uh, I have a, a colleague who essentially says it would really be nice if every project used at least one instrument that was used by someone else. It gives you some uh, measure back and forth to see how you're doing. Uh, the important issue is reliability and, and validity of the uh, instruments. And if you're doing assessments using released items from NAEP or, or uh, uh, PISA or other, thing, other exams, it's not clear that a series of released items develops a really reliable and valid assessment, either, although for their purposes, each item was uh, judged to be reliable and valid. Uh, as far as the um, common guidelines go, if you Google uh, common guidelines, uh, you'll get a list. And I think the second one is the NSF version. Uh, and I think find this very helpful because it talks about the types of projects and the types of research and evaluation that's appropriate for that project. Many projects are trying to establish causality, where really all they can do is, is establish evidence of promise. And if you think about it in terms of evidence and promise, then many of the questions become, I think, somewhat easier. Thanks. Great. That's it. Thank you, Gerhard. We really appreciate it. Let's take a couple questions that have come in. Um, Lori, how do you determine who is responsible for gathering information? Well, I, I think it depends on um, the individual's uh, capacity and their technical skills and so forth. And, you know, convenience. One of the, we didn't talk about the program evaluation standards, but that they call for evaluations to be useful, to be feasible, to be ethical, and to be accurate. And feasibility is no small consideration. So, you know, if you have access to the, the, the sources of information, if you have ready access, um, and you're, the, you're on the project team, it makes sense for you to be the one to be gathering those data directly from those participants. So, you know, it all, it all comes down to time and money to some extent and also technical competence to do the particular tasks. Great. Thank you, Lori. Also, did your project proposal include a logic model when you um, first handed it over to Terrell? Uh, no. I was completely clueless when it came to evaluation. So Terrell developed the logic model and then basically taught me logic models when we were going over it um, in, in terms of how it fit with our project. Um, uh, and then I included a very detailed, um, Terrell's very detailed uh, logic model in the, um, the appendix, not the appendix, but the supplemental um, documentation. Um, and then had sort of a more overview logic model in the project description itself to make sure that the reviewers read part of it since they don't actually have to read the, um, the supplemental document. Right. Great. Um, let's go ahead and move into the third section. If we have a little extra time, we'll take some more questions at the end. So I'll turn it back over to Lori. 
Well, there's still a lot of work to do beyond developing a strong project description with a good evaluation plan. So that's what we're going to talk about next. These are more the administrative sort of aspects. Um, evaluation should be evidenced in your references. It helps to demonstrate the evaluator's knowledge and competence. It can help show how the evaluation is grounded in and building on current knowledge and practice. And if you're going to be applying a specific evaluation approach or instrument, for example, you want to be able to provide citations to support its use in your context. And so one of the things that should be evident in this section is really showing integration of evaluation throughout all the pieces of your evaluation. As, as Asa had mentioned, um, she was looking at thinking just evaluation concerns just need to go in that evaluation section. And then she kind of saw as, as they move forward that it has implications throughout um, the proposal. And this is just one example. Um, the evaluator's bio sketch uh, should be included. It should reflect his or her past experience in conducting project evaluations. This is just a little screenshot of, of my bio sketch. You want to follow the two page NSF format. There's a link to information about bio sketches. Um, on our checklist. There's just certain categories you have to follow. You definitely don't want to attach your uh, evaluator's 30-page VITA um, to your proposal. Make it succinct. Um, you actually should include the, bi the evaluator's biosketch in the supplementary documents because the FastLane system for uploading biosketches is for senior project personnel. You don't want to confuse the reviewers about who's doing what. Of course, the budget and bus bu budget justification is a really important part of your proposal, and you definitely need a line item for evaluation here. You might recall this quote from earlier in the webinar, and the rest of it is that the requested funds must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. That's not super specific guidance, so let's look at this just a little more closely. It's a little poll, so if Mike could make the poll buttons available to you all. Um, what do you think on average is the percentage of ATE budgets spent on evaluation? This is an average of cross. Um, you know, from the smallest, you know, grants up to multi-million dollar national centers. Try to use, oh, you guys are using your markers. It's fun to use markers. Yeah, everyone's saying B, that's, we'll just skip the poll then, Mike. Yeah, the, the average is 8%. And you want to keep in mind this is, okay, right, so everyone, everyone knew that already. You guys are veterans. Um, we like to use as a rule of thumb 10%. That's just evaluation in general in all contexts. Starting at 10% um, and then going up or down as needed, depending on the degree of evaluation that you need for your project. In reality, it's 8% in the ATE program. Again, that's an average across very large and very small projects. Um, so it's just sort of a benchmark for as you develop your evaluation budget. And what goes into that budget? Well, the key pieces are going to be time, travel, and materials. And the biggest expense of a course is time and travel. You need to be able to identify how many days the evaluator is going to spend in order to give you the needed evaluation deliverables and services. The evaluator should be able to provide a number of days required for those main tasks. And you'll need to specify that number of days and the evaluator's daily rate in your budget. And don't forget about travel. I mean, you might want to have your evaluator come to the PI conference. Um, come to advisory meetings or other events. They may need to travel to collect data from participants. You might want them to meet with project staff. Um, if they're coming from a distance, the travel costs can, can add uh, quite a bit to the budget. Now, how you submit your budget depends on whether you're doing the evaluation as a consultancy or subaward. And this distinction was brought up earlier by Gerhard. If, you're, you, if your evaluation is coming on the project as a consultant, um, you'll want to provide in your overall project budget justification um, an explanation of the evaluator's cost, including the daily rate, as I mentioned, the time committed to the project, broken down by major tasks, preferably, and then also costs for travel and materials. And I apologize, but I have been disconnected, so I cannot advance slides. If somebody could do that for me, I cannot no longer see what's being presented, but hopefully someone's been able to advance the slide and you see a screenshot of the NSF budget template. Now you would use this if you're getting the evaluation evaluation on as a as a sub award. Um, so they would need to prepare that detailed budget and separate budget justification, just like those done for the primary project using NSF's um, budget template. You can get that from Fastlane. Oh, I'm back. Thank goodness. So. Hopefully, I just advanced the slides. Hopefully, you saw 
This, this is if you're doing a sub-award. You'll do the fast lane, uh, the budget template in fast lane. Okay, let's go down to supplementary documents. In this area, you want to include a commitment letter for your evaluator, your evaluator's bio sketch, and you must include a data management plan. And real quickly, because there are lots of good resources to learn more about data management plans, here's the six areas you have to address. This is required by the National Science Foundation. Actually, in our um, most recent Evaluate newsletter, we have a little article about tools that can help you develop your data management plans. And I also have the ATE Central icon there because they also address these in the webinar clip that I mentioned, which you can um, access from our website. So that's really very briefly the kind of administrative um, little details with regard to evaluation you have to integrate into your proposal. So we're going to have a quick check-in and then we're going to have time to hear from our panelists again and, and have more questions. So ATE projects are required to dedicate at least 8% of their budgets to evaluation. True or false? Yeah, that wasn't a hard one. So I clearly said there is no requirement. The expectation from NSF is that the scope of the evaluation is going to match the project and the evaluation needs of the project. The evaluation budget can be reported either as a lump sum or broken down by cost categories. True or false? Okay, most of you are saying false and that is the correct answer. Whether you're a, Getting your evaluator as a consultant or a sub-award, the costs have to be itemized. Now, if you're doing it as a sub-award, it's going to be itemized in that budget template. If it's a consultancy, you're just going to be describing it in narrative form in your own budget justification. So a letter from the evaluator is necessary to show his or her commitment to work on the project if funded. Is that really necessary? You guys are saying true, right? I have. Um, I've seen proposals where there wasn't any evidence that the evaluator actually agreed, and I've been on the other end of it as well where um, someone was funded and said, yeah, we said in our proposal you would be our evaluator, and in fact we've had no conversations. So you've got to have that commitment and you've got to have it um, attached to your proposal. So that pretty quickly wraps up what I had to say about those little bits and pieces. So this time our panelists, from our panelists, we're going to hear from Gerhard first. I'd like to go back to the data management plan. It really has two parts that are important, and it's really data management uh, in the research realm, uh, not not essentially posting the the instructional materials that you've developed. Uh, one is to to pre uh, preserve privacy of individuals, and the other is to make anonymized data available to others for secondary analysis. Uh, that's the two things I think that are really looked at um, most carefully uh, and, and should be there. Uh, on the budget, I'd say the budget should really demonstrate your ability to manage a grant. Uh, too many of the proposals come in requesting the maximum amount allowed, and the program officers look at it and, and uh, begin to wonder. So it's really helpful to have a budget that uh, is, is lean and um, shows the, that, that you do know how to manage the grant. One part that I noticed that we, we didn't uh, emphasize at all is the role of industry. And this, this is an industry-driven program. It's very helpful to be able to show industry input into what you do and also uh, industry validation of what you're doing, including getting their, their input into the valuation. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. We're going to um, turn it over to Terrell now. Thank you very much. So um, for a small project, the percentages, at least I don't think, the percentages that Lori gave at 8 to 10% don't hold. They're, um, they don't hold uh, for this situation because there really just aren't enough funds for even the 8%. Now, what she said holds true 
about um, the budget does need to match to the evaluation. And the good news is that um, with a small project, the expectations regarding evaluation are not as high. But um, what I've found is that um, with a small project, often the goal is to get a good start and to be able to get some prior results to, to show and then to be able to submit for a full proposal. So from my perspective, there's also an element of investment involved. So sometimes, in order to get the evidence for the next proposal, we intentionally will do more evaluation than the budget might reflect. Thank you so much, Terrell. Um, and we'll turn it over to Asa for a quick comment. Um, yeah, what Terrell said in terms of the, the cost, we, we sort of knew that we couldn't really afford um, a, you know, a huge evaluation plan um, so that, you know, because our project was a small project. Um, but we did also talk to Terrell about like how we might um, expand on the project later on. And we had some help also in the fact that one of our external partners is um, one of the ATE centers in Washington um, in IT. Um, and I think the other thing too was that we, we scaled our evaluation plan um, by talking to Terrell about um, how much traveling she would have to do. Cause She's on the west coast of Washington State, and we are on the um, eastern side, almost on the border of Idaho. So it's it's um, about 350 miles between us. And she had some really great suggestions in terms of, um, you know, using our internal um, evaluator. Uh, we have an institutional research department on campus, um, and so that worked um, really well. And then also in terms of um, supplemental doc section. Um, just a quick tip that I noticed while I was working on putting the proposal together, um, all the different components that goes into the proposal, I worked on them out of order um, while my district, um, who was in the process of sort of building a grants team at this point because we hadn't had an NSF grant before, uh, were really adamant that they should be done in order um, the way that they were listed on the, on the list I think that Lori showed earlier. Um, and so I had some pushback on trying to um, talk to them about that I really wanted to do the project description first. Uh, but when it came to the supplemental doc section, I think I had this idea that the smaller pieces of the proposal, the smaller the page count, the less time I would, would spend on it. But one of the things I found was that a lot of the, sup the things that goes into su supplemental docs, like the data manage plan um, and even sometimes our bio sketches, um, those were the ones that I needed a lot of feedback from other people in our district. And so they took longer from a project management um, perspective because I had to push them through many more people in the review process. So that's another thing to keep in, in mind. Um, I don't share the, like don't save until the last. Um, work on them as you're working on other stuff. And I think Thank that's you about so it. much, Asa. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to go into just a couple questions that were left over from our last section. Um, Lori, can you tell us when you say mixed methods? Did you mean just qualitative and quantitative? Because qualitative data is time consuming to analyze. Those are types of data. Mixed methods would be like surveys, focus group interviews, um, achievement data, so forth. Um, I would not uh, shy away from qualitative just because it's time consuming. Even if you only use it to get um, quick feedback so you can uh, modify what you're doing, those, the, the qualitative feedback, um, perceptions, attitudes, uh, just people's individual experiences I think are invaluable. Um, from a formative evaluation perspective, learning, uh, learning while you're doing it, how to improve while you're doing it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lori. Um, we are going to, we're at 429 right now, so to be respectful of your time, we want you to please complete our survey. It's no surprise that we really value your input being evaluators here at Evaluate. Um, so the survey is about to open. You will be, after you finish the survey, you will be um, popped into our Facebook page where you could give us more information if you would like to. Gerhard, Terrell, and Asa, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. And on behalf of everyone, our entire Evaluate team, thank you for being with us. Have a great day. <laughs>